Hello everybody and welcome to Cabaret Secrets. My name is Gary Williams and today's guest has appeared on The Tonight Show a record 76 times. She's received a Grammy Award nomination for the Best New Artist of 1965 and recorded numerous albums for RCA. Her many awards and honours include a Distinguished Arts Award, the Jazz Heritage Award. She was named an official jazz legend by the American jazz musician and she was listed as one of the best performers of the best compositions of the 20th century by the Smiths. Smithsonian Institute. Ella Fitzgerald called her the greatest white female singer in the world. Marilyn May, welcome to Cabaret Secrets. You have to understand that comment from Ella. Uh, if somebody said, oh, Ella didn't say that, she's not a racist. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no. They, it came on two different television shows that she was being interviewed. And, and um, they asked her, who's your favorite singer? She said, well, I love Carmen, Carmen McRae. I love uh, Sassy, Sarah Vaughan, and uh, the greatest, because both, both Carmen and, and, uh, and Sarah are, are black, and um, said, and the greatest white singer is Marilyn May. So that, out of context, it, it, it doesn't sound quite right, but, but that's um, the, the way it was really uh, noted in, in both, those, both the television shows. You must have been thrilled when you heard that. I was. That. Well, she and I are friends, and uh, we became friends. And uh, uh, in New York, actually, my agent uh, was her agent for a while. And when he brought her to see me, we became immediate friends. And as years went on, wherever, if we, and at times, we were in the same city. And I would go see her performance, and we would always work, you know, talk in her dressing room. And then she would come to see my performance in another city. So nice. And we would sit in dressing rooms and talk for a while. Great, great time with her. Uh, basically a very shy lady, a very, very shy. And uh, the, the only time I've, I ever saw her really assert herself was uh, in Atlanta. We were talking in her dressing room and, they, and she said, there's a reception I'm, I'm to go to after the show. Would you come with me? And I said, I would love to. She said, but let's sit here because we can really talk here. So we sat and we talked and we talked and we talked, <laughs> as she and I can do. And, uh, uh, and uh, she, um, uh, the, man, the, the man that was to escort her to the reception said, uh, it kept coming in, you know. And she said, yes, yes, I know. We'll be there in a minute. And then the second time he came in, she said, I know, I know, we'll, 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 you know, we'll hurry. And finally, the third time he came in, she said, I'm talking to my friend, and we will be there in a moment. <laughs> and I said, oh, my goodness, I'm so impressed. I said, you really asserted yourself. I said, that was good. <laughs> what did you learn from her as a, as a singer? I mean, to, to be at oh, such close quarters. Uh, you know, she's, um, um, I guess, you know, just um, from any good singer, you, you uh, I think the most important thing is to sing in tune. <laughs> that's, it's a that's start. Rather, that's rather they're basic, and uh, secondly, um, uh, to sing it in the right key. I've learned uh, through the years and and through my experience in teaching master classes that uh, many, 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 not just a few times, but quite often people will sing the song in the wrong key for them, that, that maybe they did it 20 years ago or 10 years ago mm. in that same key. Uh, I have a hunch that many times it's the accompanist, who maybe if it was a better key, it would be D or A, or a, a difficult <laughs> key, and maybe the pianist can't play in that key comfortably. So I always tell them, get a new pianist. Well, you've had the same pianist for a long time. I have plan A and plan A. I have Billy Stretch, who's been with me 34 years since he was a little boy, and I have Ted Firth, who was in New York, incredible, uh, brilliant, brilliant young man who, uh, he's quite young. He's, he joined me nine years ago and he now is 36 mm -hmm. and um, he's quite brilliant. So I, I always say that I don't have, I, I just occurred, um, uh, I just acquired uh, Plan B. Um, both of them were engaged uh, before and I had a, a date coming up that I needed a new pianist. So I found somebody else and I'm, and I'm thrilled because I had to break in somebody. Yeah. But, but Billy and Ted are, are Plan A and Plan A. <laughs> I noticed, I noticed uh, seeing you perform uh, the other night, uh, Billy, he 
just didn't take his eyes off you. He was no. right there, and I thought, you know, he must have done this a hundred times. And he was, but not only did he take, it, he was, he was glued to you, but also he was so committed to the show. And he was, because I think a lot of musical directors, a lot of pianists, a lot of musicians, they don't realize that, particularly on a small stage, they're as much a part of the performance as of you course. are. Well, and watching is is terribly important. Is the important thing they have to watch. I don't always do it exactly the same way. I may phrase it differently. Uh, and from show to show, you know, mm -hmm. and he knows that. Uh, last night, um, we were not used to doing encores. I usually walk off and that's it. Uh, both the opening night and last night, the audience applauded. They stood and applauded so long that I, I went back on, but did an encore. I was kind of shocked. And uh, on opening night, somebody requested Too Late Now, which is in the Smithsonian Institute for yeah. uh, one of the 100 best songs of the 1900s. And it's my recording of Too Late Now. So I'm sure that's where they go. Got it. That it, uh, it was uh, included in the hundred best uh, recordings of the 20th century. Last night um, we went back on and we had omitted the Secret of Life, James Taylor's yeah. Secret of Life. So I I said let's do that. But normally we segue from the Secret of Life into Here's to Life. Uh, yeah. And I only wanted to do Secret of Life, and he knew that. Uh, he's been with me so long. And, do you mean he, and knew he could just tell? You didn't discuss it beforehand. No, no. He but just... he knew he knew we're not going to segue because we'd we'd already done the tune that right, we segue right, right. to. So uh, it, which is Here's to Life. And uh, so he started playing, and and I sang an ending, and uh, we always call it endings <laughs> while you wait. <laughs> we kind of do read each other's mind. Uh, Ted too would have done that same thing mm -hmm. because they know me very well. It's. Um, so it seems it's standing ovations are something. Create. Standing ovations are something you're going to have to get used to in London. I'm so thrilled about that. We we have them in America, but I was told that that you Londoners are very reserved. And I don't find that true at all. Well, I can tell you it is true, but not for you, because I've seen a lot of things at the Crazy Cox. It's very, very rare anybody gets a standing ovation. Is that right? Very oh, rare. Nice. So I'm glad you're saying it. Do you think it's important to get a standing ovation? And do you think it's something that you can kind of engineer, that you can do little tricks perhaps? Oh, no, to... no, no. No, no, no. No, no. I think it has to be honest. I, in fact, your whole performance has to be honest. I think there are times when certain performers walk on stage and they're a whole different person on stage than what they are in person. With me, what you see is what you get, mm. uh, and I believe in that. I mm. believe people can tell mm. when they've taken on a, a grand persona or some other person than themselves. And I think the audience picks up on honesty. I, I think subconsciously people really do get it, that, that you're honest about it and that it's really you. I don't think you can manufacture a standing ovation, although, gee, I haven't ever tried. I'll, do, I'll try to do it. Maybe I'll <laughs> think about that one. <laughs> but do you think honesty is the, the cornerstone of any cabaret performer? For me, it is. For me, it is. I, I, think, uh, I think you have to be real. I think you have to know your craft. I think you have to work. I, I have so many people that study with me that that they are, would rather work on the the hiring of the musicians or the or the promotion of it yes. or whatever. That comes so secondary to me. Yes. The main thing is the work that you do for the audience because the audience is the star. You're not the star. The well, but do you make compromises for the... If you think, well, I really want to do this and this and this because I love these songs. We no. think, you know what, the audience, they, this is going to go better for this crowd. Would, what, which would you do? What you like or what they like? Well, uh, you don't really know what they like, you know, when you walk into a room. Uh, I must say, here on opening night, I had, I did have several requests from people. Now, now the email situation is is so predominant that they can email you and say, "I hope you're going to sing." So and so. Curse email. Yeah, right. No, it's lovely because that's nice to know. But there are certain things that I would that I would always do, whether without their request, and. Uh, um, that I think um, are, are communication. I think it has. You have to communicate. It has to be communication. And there are certain songs that communicate better than others. Many times you see people 
I always say they sing for themselves. Mm. And I sing not for the audience, I sing to the audience. Mm -hmm. Just a different technique. I'm not saying one one is wrong. I know that there are many people that there's a fourth wall. Mm. And I don't think in a nightclub mm. that there should be a fourth wall. I mm. think it's 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 to those people because they're so near you. It's conversation. The the uh, the, the story of every there's a story in every song. Mm. And a, and a meaningful lyric, hopefully. I'm I always take the 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 choice of songs from the lyric. Yes, and I noticed that it's interesting you say that because so many of the songs that you sang, they were almost like an extension of your conversation. The lyrics, even though you hadn't written the songs, they were so well suited to you and to the moment that the songs, this sounds a bit corny, but it, the songs felt like you were talking to us through the songs. And thank you, that's what I try to convey. Uh, you, you inspired me to listen to some uh, some old records of mine, and and because here's to life is uh, it's uh, Shelley Horn, wasn't it? That uh, yeah, yes, Shelley, yes, Horn. Shelley Horn. Did. And um, she did I was it slower than I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but and you did it more conversationally as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was thinking, wow, what a great a little, song. There's a little passage in there that I wrote that that I that had to fit into the song. You're right. And 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 I was listening. I think, oh, this is such a good song. Oh, I'd love to do this song. And I thought, you know what? There's no. I need to wait 34. 40 years before I could do this song because it's yeah. so much more powerful. Because from someone of your age, exactly. it's there. It's just, I mean, it was, I'm going, literally, I'm going goosebumpy now just, yeah. just thinking of it. I think that's, that's another requisite is that you choose the material that suits you and your look, you know, and, and your demeanor and, and your voice, you know. I think um, there again, many times I watch people and I think, why would she sing? some particular song that's either meant for a younger woman or an older mm -hmm. woman, you know, I, I was always curious about that. Mm. Did, did you, one of the nice things about getting older is that you can sing these songs with more truth, can't you? Well, do, yeah. Could you remember, was there a time when you were younger thinking, oh, I can't wait till I'm old enough to sing that? Never, never, <laughs> I didn't, I, I just, I'm, on, I'm always in the moment, I, I never yeah. think ahead. Yeah. You don't dare think ahead because you never know where this career is going to take you, you know. Yeah. So you, I, I, I've never really People say, you know, you. I'm sure you dreamed of stardom. No, 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 no. You, I, I never dreamed. <laughs> I just, it was my work. I still don't dream. <laughs> you know, of a, a, and I know that's a terrible thing to say because I think it's a lovely thing when you can say, I'm working toward my dream, and that's all lovely and ethereal and marvelous and prophetic. <laughs> but I am really nuts and bolts. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> you must have, the, 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 the number of years, I mean, you're in, you're in your 80th year now, you've been doing this for a long it's time. Crazy. The, it is, isn't it? Because yeah, you I look know. like a lot, lot younger. And well, I thought, and, and you know what the nice thing is, for, let's talk about your age. You got that standing ovation because you were fantastic at whatever age you are, and your voice is so strong. I hope and it's your age is, it's, it's, age. It's, 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 <laughs> and, but it's so refreshing because your age is a complete irrelevance, complete irrelevance, yeah. except when you're singing those songs, which, which have great pathos, you know, but yeah. you as a performer, and it's sounds like I'm being very gushy and paying you compliments, but I'm not actually no, trying I to pay it. you compliments. Continue. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, your voice is great, you look great, you, you, you know, you're spry. I love the high kicks. Sure. That's a show-off. That's yeah. my one show-off moment. <laughs> The career, the length of career that you've had, there must have been periods which have been very dry and you must have had the ups and downs like we all have. Well, sure, you know, and uh, you wonder if you're going to get booked. Um, I, um, where was the dry spell? Probably in the 90s when the rooms that I worked, uh, the Venetian rooms in the Fairmont hotels in, in, in uh, the United States, and... Um, uh, many of the hotel rooms that I worked steadily every, every year, you know, I would be booked back and they closed, you know, the businessman's expense account was, that was the end of that. Mm. And, and then I started creating little clubs. I would walk in, in Houston, Texas, I walked in, in the, uh, oh gosh, in the, I think 90, 91, uh, I walked into this little uh, restaurant and uh, there was a piano there over in the corner and, uh, and and things were dry as far as work it was concerned. So I said, uh, you know, and I was with a PR man from Houston, a, it was a very dear friend of mine, and I said, boy, this would be a good room. I said, if they would just build me a little stage and get a follow spot and, uh, and a PA system, we could, we could do this. Wound up that 
I worked it for two years, uh, um, usually six weeks at a time, because I think with with that long long engagement, I think one week is not enough. Word of mouth is is valuable to me, and and. Um, when they when they know how you perform and they tell their friends, then the friends have to have the time to get to that performance. Yeah. Maybe they have the next three days planned. Yeah, yeah. So if you're there next week, then then they can plan to come to see you. That's always worked for me. So we would stay in this particular room in Houston, Texas for six weeks. Then I would be off for three months and I would come back for another six. I did it for two years and just created that room. You know? So you just found the work. I mean, I was wondering, I mean, what do you do? What the what work for myself. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's right, right. So what, I mean, in, in the dry spells, did you ever have periods where you thought, God, am I ever going to work again? And I mean, did you? Did no, you... I was busy. I just stayed right. busy. I decorated. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I had friends' homes and they, and I'm kind of good at that. And I'd go decorate and I kept traveling and I just kept busy, you know, um, uh, I always sang. There were always one-nighters, and and there were there were engagements. They just weren't quite as often. Mm. And mm. Uh, I just kept. I love my friends, and I love to travel, and um, I worked very hard at it. Mm. Um, I never did anything else. I never took another job, mm. you know, mm. really. But but um, how do you keep your voice in good shape, e- even in the periods where you're not singing as much as you'd like? Well, I always sang as much as I liked, you right. know. Do, but do you sing around that? Do you do, do you vocalize every oh, day? Never, do you, never. you, know, you don't no. know any of that? <laughs> never. <laughs> <laughs> I have I love to, it. but don't do as I do. Two do martini, as I, two martinis do, instead. Do as I say. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't don't do that. I think you should sing. Uh, I, rest is a very important thing to me. If I get my rest, then then my voice hangs in there. Because it's a bit of a slog doing it you're here at the crazy cox for a week it's a bit of a slog right every every night well oh no 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 i love every night no that's when it's better the the more often the the engagement the the longer the more the more often you sing every night the better it it's like it's getting oiled yeah you know? but you, i mean you do you take when i'm doing a, a run like that i'm so i just live like a nun you know i take well, such yeah, and care and you should and that's a good thing and, and people think you're out every night partying and knocking about the no. booze but it's I, when it's over you know yeah, yeah no years ago I used to hang, <laughs> and I still hang till midnight, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. But, but uh, no, I don't think you can party, party, party and maintain your voice. I never smoked, and I never drank very much. You know, mm. I kid about drinking, but I really don't. Mm. I had three alcoholic husbands, and, and the last person that I was in love with was a meaningful love affair, I call it. And all of them, all of them were alcoholics, mm. and so I lived through the, yeah, <laughs> that yeah. era. And now, they're, they're drinking for you, right? And I always say now my love affair is with the audience. Yeah, you know? yeah. You um, describe yourself, I think. I mean, the impression I got anyway you, as, as, as a cabaret singer. You talk about being a cabaret yeah, singer. No, I don't. I don't say cabaret, and I I, I, I say nightclub. <laughs> Nightclub. I, right. Yeah, because I. I what you call? Said, what did you call? I read somewhere. I what did you add a name? You had a name. Upholstered sewers. It says somewhere. The, the uh, musicians called the nightclubs upholstered sewers. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Years ago, that was a that was a, a slang version for clubs. You know, they and then other people uh, years ago called maybe still they call them joints. Yeah. You know, and uh, nightclubs and. Because I I think of the place like the Crazy Cox. I think of it as a cabaret room. What I what my perception yes. and what I saw you do. But seem to me to be cabaret. Club. It's like a nightclub. Is what's the difference between a nightclub and a cabaret? Well, I was thinking, what's the difference between jazz and cabaret? Because right. all, your, all your awards, your accolades that I've seen on Wikipedia, which of course is where we get all that information, right. Right. Um, it, everything seems to be jazz related. But when I saw you, there's a, I can hear a lot of jazz influence in your singing, but it's not what I would call a, it wasn't, you're not what I would call a jazz singer. Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't scat every tune mm. if that's a requisite for being a jazz singer. See, I think I am a jazz singer. And what is it that what, what is it that makes I a jazz singer? I don't sing the exact melody. Mm. There are there are wonderful uh, phrases and uh, optional notes that you can find. Um, I I work I just worked Birdland and we did more jazz material. I did Take Five and I mm. did um, tunes that people associate with jazz, but uh, basically. I don't think there's any difference with in me. The the jazz singers, I think people's common knowledge about about jazz singers is they close their eyes and sing. And I communicate. I can sing those same notes with my eyes wide open, looking into your eyes. Yes. <laughs> and I think that's a good thing. I think 
I think uh, the jazz singer thinks I should entertain. I should just be aloof and sing for myself. I think you can entertain and sing jazz and do it all. Yeah, you know, I and agree. communicate. I I don't see anything wrong with being a jazz singer who communicates. You're a jazz singer with a cabaret sensibility. Well, there you go. Write that down. <laughs> 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 because a lot of people, you're right, it often for, for jazz singers that uh, communication, having a laugh, making a joke, is sort of seems to be a, a frowned upon. It's almost like it takes away from and the yet, serious business of singing jazz. And yet Mel Torme was one of the great singers in our world, and he was very funny. Yeah. Very funny in his performances. You worked with him? I knew him very well, never worked with him. And um, the last conversation I had with him was about three months before he died. In his dressing room, uh, he came to Kansas City, and it was interesting because as I'm walking down the hall from his dressing room uh, after his performance, we sat there for maybe an hour and had a great time of catching up, and as I'm walking down the hall, he hollered at me. He stood in his door of the dressing room and said, Marilyn, and I turned around and he said, he pointed his finger to me and said, you take very good care of yourself. And I said, oh, Mel, I do. I said, we, I said, we can't do what we do without taking good care of yourself. And he didn't take real good care of himself. He ate a lot of ice cream and, mm -hmm. and, and worked, worked, you know, oh, so steadily. And, and, um, uh, he, three three months later, he passed away. Wow. Who, who were your great influences? Who well, were your mentors along the way? Oh, nobody, really. I, I, I listened to... You just um, rolled up your sleeves and got on with it. Well, I, right, I was just busy doing it rather than listening. I don't listen very much to anybody. I really I love don't. it. I really don't. You're a practical guy. I, I have to be honest. Um, I, I enjoy a lot of other people. Um, Michael, Michael Feinstein, I just, worked, I just did uh, three weeks with him a couple of years ago uh, in his room, Feinstein's, in New York. But was there anybody and in the early years that took you under their wing and, and sort of no. showed you the room? No, you no, just no, did no, it all no, on, your, no. on your own. No, because I lived in the Middle West and most everybody were on either coast, you know. Mm. I'm, if you t uh, take me under the wing, I guess Steve Allen, you would say that he did. He at least introduced me to them to the uh, television world. Mm. And um, uh, Steve was very good to me and, and talked, you know, wrote the liner notes for my first album with mm. RCA and was a great champion of mine. Uh, Johnny Carson was incredible to me. Mm. You know, he, he made statements about my performances when I would do his show. I did it 76 times. Mm. And um, when I would do it, he would make statements. We have recordings of, of his statements. My mother wouldn't have complimented me as much as he did <laughs> and so you know those kind of people I'm very very um, grateful uh, to for, for you, you seem to have still such a great uh, lust and energy for, for life oh, and a passion for what you do oh I do I do uh, last night it was interesting because the audience like like opening night uh, in this particular room, they are really there to enjoy, to listen, and to. It's. I mean, they lean up in their in their chairs, and and that makes it very very nice for me. In that that, and and rather intense, the audience is intense, and consequently. I get intense in the material, and um, it's a, it's really a joy to be able to deliver to an audience that you feel really is there to hear what you have to say. It's so good to have you with us. Thank you for talking thank to us you, today. Thank you so much, Gary. Thank you for listening to this Cabaret Secrets podcast. If you've got any comments or questions, please visit cabaretsecrets.com where you'll also find details of the Cabaret Secrets book, an indispensable guide on how to create your own show, travel the world, and get paid to do what you love.